Hello? There we go. Well, happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. I guess we're all sticking to the protocol of not speaking. <laughs> Welcome, families and friends, um, guests. Um, it's wonderful to see all of you and worship with all of you. My name is Moses Kang, and I'm the pastor here at First CRC, and especially a warm welcome to those who are watching through the live stream. We recognize that there are a lot of options out there, um, but we're glad that you have joined in with us in worshiping our God on this Thanksgiving Sunday. I also want to give a special welcome to um, the Luth and Borkdor family of David and Melissa for Oliver's baptism, and, and especially welcome back Pastor John Luth back to our church to help lead in today's service, so thank you. For those of you who are receiving our MailChimp, um, the study guide for this sermon series is, is found in your MailChimp, and if you actually go, it's a Google Doc document, so it updates automatically, so whatever you find on that page is the most recent one, so please uh, make use of it, um, talk to your friends and families. Um, members of your small group, and ask some of those questions that you find in those small, in the study guide. Uh, Women's Connect, I hear that there's already quite a few, probably more than a few, um, of our women who has joined and Sisters in Christ. Um, if you'd like to join this WhatsApp group, please contact Stephanie, and I think Stephanie's gonna make an announcement. Thank you, Pastor Moses. Well, we know we have sound, so that's awesome. This, if you would like to sign up for Sisters in Christ, please do so before Wednesday. We will be matching you up with a partner. The idea is that you know who your partner is and that you just encourage each other. If you decide later on that you want to um, have a partner, we can always add more but uh, Wednesday is when we are making the initial groupings, so please get in touch with me. And it's a great way to encourage and support each other, especially in this time of pandemic, um, whether it's a phone call or a text or whatever, uh, to encourage each other and help each other grow in our love for God and neighbor. Thank you. Thank you, Steph. Um, on, the thank on this Thanksgiving Sunday, we're thankful for our two brothers who have joined in the Ministry of Music, so thank you to our trumpeters. And also, um, last week I forgot to mention something to give thanks for, which is that Kevin and Kayla um, have had their daughter, Gracie, and she's doing very well. So congratulations and um, blessings. Thanksgiving Sunday is all about remembering what God has done for us. Not what we do for God, but what God has done for us. So will you join with me as we stand as you're able and joining with all things that are breathing and living and singing a song of thanksgiving to God, our creator, Hosanna and praise.
<laughs> it's good to be with you this morning. Um, Audrey and I are really happy to be here with you all. And um, yeah, just as uh, Pastor Moses was saying, I served here as a pastor um, until 1998, so that's 22 years ago uh, this August. And Audrey and I left here for Alberta. Oops. Okay, we'll try that. With our four fairly young children. And um, then I served a church in St. Albert, Alberta for about 18 years. And then over the last few years have transitioned into chaplaincy ministry. And so these days I um, go in every day to the inner city and uh, work as a chaplain at um, a homeless shelter and an addiction recovery program. So uh, kind of different. Um, I don't go to visit people in their homes, but I go to visit the home where people live and stay. So that's, that's a little bit, just a tiny bit of what um, we've been doing, what we've been up to. In the meantime, um, Audrey has been teaching and continues to teach in elementary school. And um, yeah, that's, that's kind of it. Also, just to, to say, as uh, Pastor Moses did already, in terms of acknowledging people who are here with us uh, virtually or, or watching remotely, that um, Oliver, who is uh, now our, our uh, little grandson, is surrounded by a family of love. And so we acknowledge that uh, Borgdorfs and Wagensvelds and Bosmas and Luths are all uh, tuning in and watching this morning as well as we, in these um, really weird times for all of us, uh, gather and, and live out our faith by saying this morning too, we have much to be thankful for. Uh, thankfulness, among other things, is a discipline, and so let's turn our hearts thankfully to the Lord, and I just invite you to read responsively the call to worship that you have in your order. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to Him. Let us sing psalms of praise to Him. For the Lord is a great God, a great King above all gods. He holds in His hands the depths of the earth and the mightiest mountains. The sea belongs to Him, for He made it. His hands formed the dry land too. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God. The flock under His care. And so receive God's greeting. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus the Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And... Um, I invite you to greet each other, and apparently greeting each other with the peace of Christ is different these days. Um, we're, our rental this week is a Jeep, and my, I was instructed that Jeep drivers do this. Uh, so whatever it takes to just sort of stay where you are and wave or do the Jeep greeting or so, just to pass the, the peace of Christ to each other. Peace of Christ to you all, wherever you are. Uh, it's such a blessing to be united with God's people. Psalm 67 gives us reason to praise God and to give thanks to him for our blessings, but also to remember that these blessings are not for us alone. They are for us to share with his world. So let's sing together. And uh, in light of our sermon series about growth, I especially appreciated um, the beginning of verse 4, may the seeds of mercy grow in us. For those who have not heard, may songs of praise live lives of grace to spread your word. Let's praise God together.
hear the words of thanksgiving in Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will thank the Lord with all my heart as I meet with his godly people. How amazing are the deeds of the Lord. All who delight in him should ponder them. Everything he does reveals his glory and majesty. His righteousness never fails. He causes us to remember his wonderful works. How gracious and merciful is our Lord. He gives us food for those who fear him. He always remembers his covenant. He has shown his great power to his people by giving them the lands of other nations. All he does is just and good. All his commandments are trustworthy. They are forever true, to be obeyed faithfully and with integrity. He has paid a full ransom for his people. He has guaranteed his covenant with them forever. What a holy, awe-inspiring name he has. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true wisdom. All who obey his commandments will grow in wisdom. Praise, Praise him, him forever. forever.
Baptism is um, much about the love and faithfulness of God. And so as we witness baptism this morning, one of the things that um, I just invite you to do if, if you have been baptized, and you know, in, if we were not in COVID times, I would do this just a little more like physically or so, but um, just invite you to remember your own baptism. You know, to remember perhaps, uh, as is literally true for both David and for Melissa, that there was a time when you were held here and received the covenant sign of God's promises, of his love, of his mercy, uh, that for all of you who have been baptized, um, I would just walk around and throw this out there and say, remember your baptism. Remember God's love in your life. Remember his call on your life. Remember his faithfulness to you. And so uh, baptisms are always uh, special moments in a congregation's life. I understand that Oliver's baptism is, I think, the first baptism uh, since the middle of March or so with uh, all the pandemic stuff. And of course, baptism, as I've mentioned already, is a really significant time for us as a family and for, uh, for you as family too. And so people of God hear the words of Jesus. All authority in the heavens and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, this is my promise, I am with you always to the very end of the age. And together we say, because of this command and promise, we baptize believers and their children. Our gracious God has always desired to hold his people in a covenant embrace. God declares over and over, I will be their God and they will be my people. Pursuing this deep desire, God called Abraham and Sarah to trust in him. And the heart of the covenant promise to Abraham and Sarah is that they would be a blessing people. They would be people who bring blessing to the world, that God would bring his blessing to the world through them. And God gave Abraham and Sarah a covenant sign that they belonged to him. Yeah. Baptism. God now claims us in Christ, marks us as his own people, and seals our membership in God's covenant community, the church. Baptism is the covenant sign that God frees us from the power of sin and death, uniting us with Christ in his death and resurrection. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are washed clean from sin. God's grace in baptism calls us to leave the life of sin and to give ourselves to him in trust, love, and obedience. From the beginning, God graciously has included our children in his covenant. All his promises are for them as well as us. God shows his love to generations of those who love and follow him. Jesus himself embraced little children and blessed them, and the Apostle Paul tells us that believers' children are holy. We are to teach them that they have been set apart by baptism as God's own children so that as they grow older, they may respond to him in personal faith and commitment. And so let's um, bow together and um, offer a prayer of thanksgiving as we remember our baptisms and give thanks to God. We thank you, O oh God, for our baptism into Christ's death and resurrection. In the beginning, your spirit moved over the waters, and you created everything that is, seen and unseen. In the time of Noah, you destroyed evil in the water of the flood, and by your saving ark, you gave a new beginning. In the night of trouble, you led Israel through the sea, out of slavery, into the freedom of the promised land. In the water of Jordan, our Lord was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. In the baptism of Christ's death and resurrection, you have set us free from sin and from death and opened up the way to eternal life. And so may Christ, who sank deep into death and was raised Lord of life, 
Keep us and our little ones in the grip of his hand. May your Holy Spirit separate us from sin and mark us with a faith that can stand the light of day and endure the dark of night. To you be all honor and glory, dominion and power, now and forever, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so, uh, David and Melissa, as this morning you're presenting Oliver for baptism, we've got some questions to ask you if you could just come up. And um, it's kind of fun to say that we've met here before. (laughs) So here are the questions. Do you profess your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And do you affirm the promises of God made to you and to Oliver in his word? Do you promise to instruct Oliver by word and example with the help of the Christian community in the truth of God's word and in the way of salvation through Jesus Christ? Do you promise to pray for him and teach him to pray? Do you promise to nurture him within the body of believers as a citizen of Christ's kingdom? We do. God helping us. All right, if you bring Oliver in. Oliver James, child of the covenant. Whoops. Try that again. Oliver James, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There we go. Oh, we wrecked his hair. So, Oliver James, child of the covenant, in baptism you are sealed with the Holy Spirit, and you are marked as Christ's own. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you make us new persons in Jesus Christ through grace alone. We pray for Oliver. Bless and strengthen him daily with the gift of your Holy Spirit. Unfold to him the riches of your love. Deepen his faith. Keep him from the power of evil. Enable him to live a holy and blameless life until your kingdom comes. And look with kindness on Melissa and David. Let them always rejoice in the gift that you have given them. Grant them the presence of your Holy Spirit that they may bring up this little boy to know you, to love you, and to serve you and their neighbor. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And so, brothers and sisters, we now receive Oliver into Christ's church, and I charge you to nurture and love him. And uh, it's one of the things about being baptized into a community of people that um, trusts in Jesus Christ together, that we say to this little boy this morning that no matter what, Uh, We're for you, you know, that no matter what, uh, we'll walk with you. No matter what, we'll support you and bless you and walk alongside Jesus with you. And so I ask you to uh, to stand and um, to say these really important words that uh, you're addressing directly to, to Oliver. And so we say together, we will, God helping us, Oliver James, With joy and thanksgiving, we now welcome you into Christ's church, for we are all one in Christ. We promise to love, encourage, and support you, and to help you know and follow Christ. Awesome. So we sing together as a song of response now to what we have witnessed what we have uh, received from God and what we've seen Oliver receive from God, uh, the song, I Am Not My Own.
Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> Last week, um, during children's message, and of course during the MailChimp, and we've continued to give the message out that we want to build a wall together. We want to build a wall together. And I don't know if it, this was coincidence or not, but, um, but this week, on the final week of our growing series, um, is Thanksgiving Sunday. And so we made the charge to the congregation. Can you write down things that you're thankful for? Thanksgiving on a pre piece of brick or a Lego block or anything like that. The kids got one in their kit and we said, bring it back for Thanksgiving Sunday. And we're going to try and build this wall together. And um, we got a lot of bricks. And so I want to build the wall together, and I wish we weren't in COVID times, and I'd invite Justin and Cam to help me build this wall, but unfortunately, I'm going to have to do it myself. So the first brick that I have is an actual brick that someone brought into church, and it says, thankful to God for our family, good health, and friends. And I'm not a good builder in any sense, but my thinking is that if this is going to last, I have to probably place it here or else the whole thing might come down. Another one, the gift of music. Thank you for the two by four. I should probably put it this way so you can see it. For family, music, health, church, friends, home, Bible, food, God's love, grace, and mercy. For health, freedom, for family, friends, and church, pasture, Bible. We are thankful for God's daily provision and for his faithfulness to us. Praise be to him. Our church. I like this one. I didn't do it, but it says, my wife and all she does. For faith, family, friends, forgiveness, rest, hope, with grateful hearts, our thanks we bring to church, creation, health, work, abundance, joy, love. This one, and I know you can't see it, but if you do go on our Instagram page, you'll be able to see this one. And we have a whole bunch, Jesus, for love, for fall colors, creation, good health, neighbor, family, friends, thank you for my friends, Justin, my cats, eyesight, thank you, Luke. Another one, cat, for my cat, meow. For pets and family, we are thankful for salvation, Jirtsma family. For church. I really like this one. For yummy food and for Jesus. Um, for, for Mrs. Vanderboon, God created this world. I think that's from my house, actually. For strawberries... Thank you for my friends and family. Yeah, I think Nehemiah did a better job than I ever will. For skate parks. For daddy and mommy, my fish, VBS. For pineapple pears. I like that. For Lego, for fuzzy blankets, for the sun, yes. And for brothers. Another one, my brother, cat food, cat friends, tech for soccer, for Emmett. We just have a couple more. For popcorn, thank you, Lucy. Popcorn is amazing. And um, last but not least, I don't know why I grabbed this last. Pastor Moses. I didn't write that one. 
Now, why did I read all these things? Because, you know, this year, it hasn't been a great year. Oh, there's more. Hold on. Um, for baptism, for community, for salvation, for Steph's 50th birthday today, happy birthday, for faithfulness. I'm going to guess that this one is probably from... Let's see if I passed physics. I guess I did. That in spite of all the things that we think have gone terribly wrong, there's so much to give thanks for. My cat for family, for wonderful friends, for Lego blocks, for yummy food, for pineapple pears, for the sun, for the gift of baptism that we get to share that reminds us that we are all united under the covenant that God has made with us. So in spite of our situations where we can't play five-on-five hockey, in spite of our situations where we have to mask all day at school, we have so much to give thanks for because our God is an awesome God. Our God is a God who will hold us in his hands regardless of whatever situation we may be. And let's sing about that. God who's got the whole world in his hands. We invite you to use the actions along with us as a way of praising God. I can breathe. <laughs> sure, a bit of interesting information. Most of you don't know this, but uh, I work on a, f a farm, and it's been one heck of a harvest so far. Um, I've been helping Jocko DeLang out with uh, his potato harvest. Sure, a bit of tidbit of information with you. One bunker can hold 1.4 million pounds of potatoes, if you can believe that. One bunker alone. It's pretty interesting. But let's get back to the Word of God. And before we read, let's go to God in word of prayer. Dear Lord, in this world where A microscopic bacteria seemingly out of control or seemingly crazy enough as it is seems to threaten our society, Lord, with health issues, Lord. We ask that you give 
everybody peace in the midst of this storm. We ask that you keep us in your care, keep us health, wise, safe, and uh, secure in your hands, Lord. We ask that as we read from your word, may we understand what you are trying to say to us and give Pastor Moses the words of wisdom to speak to us. We pray for the light of the Holy Spirit. We pray that your spirit may descend upon us to be more like you each day, to give us the strength to go out there and be a shining example of who you are in the community and the broader community beyond. We ask these things for Jesus' sake, in whose name we pray. Amen. So I'll be reading from Nehemiah 8, first 12 verses, and then skipping to verse 18. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled as one man in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the law and all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him on his right stood Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, Amasiah. And on his left were Padiah, Mishael, Melchijah, Hashem, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them, and as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen and Amen. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Yamin, Ahub, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Maseah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, and Peliah instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was being read. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the scribe, priest and scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, this day is sacred to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is sacred to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for this is a sacred day. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away to eat and to drink to send portions of food and to celebrate with great joy because they now understood the words that had been made to, known to them. In verse 18, day after day, from the first day to the last, Ezra read from the book of the law of God. They celebrated the feast for seven days and on the eighth day, in accordance with the regulation, there was an assembly. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Brandon, for the reading. Happy Thanksgiving. Look around. It's wonderful to see so many people here. It's wonderful to see some of our university students who've come home for Thanksgiving. Family get together where we see colors all around us. 
Thanksgiving is a great time. It reminds us of a lot that is good in the world. We have baptisms. We have new babies. Cry of babies. Parents who are filled with joy at losing sleep. There's Thanksgiving parties. You know, last Sunday I was out there and uh, I remember everyone was just dying to get in the car and go home. And I don't blame you because it was raining, it was cold. But this Thanksgiving, when we're all, I guess, having Thanksgiving dinner outdoors, the weather is lovely. Thanksgiving is a time to give thanks for all the good things that have happened. And from what we could see in the bricks, there's plenty to give thanks for. And as Brandon read for us, the Israelites have a lot to give thanks for too. In spite of everything that had taken place and how they got there, they sowed, they grew, they harvest, they prune, and now they're harvesting. They're harvesting the fruits of their labor. Nehemiah says in verse 10, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. And I wish I could just say the word of the Lord, thanks be to God, and we can all go home and do exactly as Nehemiah just said. We'll be home before lunch starts. But that's not really the end of that verse because Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. And it says, do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, What we do in Thanksgiving, that's what we do. We enjoy choice food, we have sweet drinks, and we send some to those who have nothing prepared. I'm sure a lot of you may already have the turkey in the oven or it's out of the freezer and it's getting ready for tomorrow. There's choice drinks. We've already been to the stores to buy all our drinks and we've called our neighbors to make sure that they don't spend Thanksgiving alone. That's what we do in Thanksgiving. We are harvesting. And in many ways, we celebrate the bounties that God had given us. But isn't it interesting that the text tells us that people were grieving. They were weeping. They were mourning. Why were they grieving? Why were they weeping? Why were they mourning? Why were they grieving at a time when they had accomplished so much, when they have gone against their enemies, when they have stayed up at night with their weapons to protect the work that they were doing, when they had a governor in Nehemiah who would lead them into the battle against the time of building a wall out of ruins. Yet they, when they have accomplished this, are grieving. They are grieving. Maybe things don't change all that much. Because we are here on Thanksgiving Sunday. We celebrate the baptism and welcome another member into our covenantal family. But the truth of the matter is, we too are grieving. On this Thanksgiving Sunday, when there is so much good, we are grieving. We are grieving the COVID-19 situation. I don't even have to go along about that. We are grieving because some of us have lost loved ones. We are grieving because people close to us are in the hospital. We are grieving because we can't celebrate Thanksgiving together as families are kept apart. We are grieving because people who are working towards the common good cannot seem to agree and have to fight each other. We are grieving Because people of different color or ethnicity or background, orientation, they're faced with a huge challenge. Now, I am painting in broad strokes, and it may seem all dull, but the truth is, we are living in a good world. We're living in a good life. We have a roof over our heads, the furnace is going, there's food on the table, yet we are grieving. But if we come to think about Thanksgiving and the accomplishments that we have had through the harvest, I don't think it's really hard to understand why one may grieve. Because in the harvest, we celebrate the accomplishments that we have made. 
Because in the harvest, we celebrate the accomplishments that we have made. We have sowed the plant, we have allowed it to grow, we pruned it so that it can really grow and get ready for the harvest. But when we think about it, it really is not about what we had done, what we have done. The accomplishments of harvest is about what God has done for us, in us, and through us. It's not about what I've done, but what God has done. And that's why we give thanks. If Thanksgiving was about what we had done and what we had accomplished, probably true that we may grieve. Last week I was talking to some of the members here and um, one of the farmers in our community said, Pastor Moses, you can't believe it. Our harvest is like three times what it was last year. Probably the best harvest we've had in years. And I said, wow, that would be great. That means people will be tithing more. And this farmer kind of joked and said, well, no, this year makes up for last year. If we think about the harvest simply about what we have done and our accomplishments, it's so easy to grieve. Because so many times the results that we get may not be exactly what we had wanted or what we had hoped for or how we had wanted it or how we had hoped for. But if we think about Thanksgiving, about what God has done in us and through us, then it's not about our accomplishments. It's simply about being thankful for God's faithfulness. You see, Thanksgiving was never about giving thanks for what was accomplished. When we look at the history of Thanksgiving here in North America, the indigenous people in North America had a history of holding communal feasts in celebration of the fall harvest that predates the arrival of European settlers. Now back then, whether the harvest was plenty or little, whether there was more to share or little to give, whether it was a very harsh, harsh weather so they had nothing, or whether it was good, the people gathered together for a communal feast and celebrating a time where they give thanks. The celebration was about what the harvest gave. When we look at some of the things on these Thanksgiving blocks, we come to realize that it's not what we have done. It doesn't marry a party to celebrate an accomplishment. That's because it's God's accomplishments. God has done it. God did it. God provided the yummy food. God provided the cat for us. God provided great health. God provided eyesight. God provided the sun. God provided the pineapple pears. God provided Jesus. When we look at the text that we read today, we see that during this feast... When the people gather in this square, Ezra comes up, stands on a platform, and he starts reading the scripture to the people. We see that all the people were gathered, and they're listening to the word of God. And it wasn't just a reading of one chapter or maybe two. It wasn't a reading from one sitting. In fact, they stood from daybreak till noon. So we're talking about five, six hours of Ezra reading people standing and listening. Now, what I find fascinating is Ezra is reading for five or six hours and all the people are gathered, men and women and all who are able to understand. So kids are understand, just like you, you, you. And they're listening for six hours of somebody reading this text. And the people started bowing down to worship, saying amen, and they start weeping and they start grieving. Now, Scripture doesn't actually say why. In fact, commentators don't know why either. They say, well, Ezra was a good storyteller, so it probably struck them in the heart. But I was thinking about what, why, why would you grieve? Why would you weep? Why would you mourn when you're listening to the Word of God? Now, of course, in the scripture, it says the book of the law. Now, law sometimes makes us grieve, makes us weep. But if we think about it in the terms of the word of God, why are they weeping? Why are they grieving? I wonder 
if when the people were listening to this, they started to realize that God had been faithful all the time. That God had been faithful all the time. Although they gathered together upon the completion of this wall, upon their completion, upon their cutting the rocks, making sure it's level, gathering them, putting it up, using different tools to haul these pieces of stone up so that they complete this wall. They've gathered for a big celebration. Maybe they were hoping that Ezra would read a chapter from the book of the law and expound on it as Ezra was well known to do. And after reading and expounded, they would all go back, have a big feast for now with the city walls, they're protected. And after all, with the cupbearer of the king being their governor, whom shall they fear? But that's not what it is. As they're listening to the word of God, a few minutes have passed, and there is bickering. When's Ezra going to finish? This is boring. But to some who are listening, God's word sprouts in them. God's word sprouts blossoms in them, into their heart. It it reminds them, and it reminds them of God's faithfulness throughout the book of the law. Of how God had promised Noah that he would love his people and never forsake them. About how God had promised Abraham that he will make his nation great, that he will give him an offspring, that God delivered Moses to bring his people out of Egypt, that God would deliver his people out of the bonds of slavery into the land where milk and honey would overflow. As they're hearing these stories, they're reminded again and again that although they have been unfaithful, God has been faithful. Although they have doubted, God never gave up on them. Although they felt that they were able to build their wall with their own power, it took God working in Nehemiah to show his people God's faithfulness. And that's, my brothers and sisters, what Thanksgiving is about. It is a reminder that without God, we are nothing. Without God, we are nothing. That everything that we have, they're nothing without God. And that is hope. I was reading an article a couple weeks back um, looking at optimism, talking, an article talking about optimism against hope, optimism against hope. We live in a world where optimism dwells. We say, come on, positive thinking. Come on, positive thinking. A lot of sports coaches out there probably know this. Come on, think positively. You can do it. And, and, and I do this to Justin all the time. It's like, come on, Justin, you can do it. He's practicing on his piano, and I say, Justin, three more times, three more times, and you're done. Dad, I don't want to do it. Three more times, and then, we, and then you'll be done. Think positively. Don't think that you have three more times to do. You've already done seven times, so you only need to do three times more, and then you're done. Somehow we think that when we think positively, things will get better. We think that if we think that we can do it, if we believe that we can do it, then we can do it. That's optimism. It's about our accomplishments by our own doings. But that's not hope. Hope is putting our trust in God. Hope is knowing that it's not us who are doing it, but it's God who's doing it. Hope is not putting our trust in us, but hope is putting our trust in in God. God supplies us with hope, and God supplies that to us through his word. Just as the Israelites bow before the word of God, we too are called to bow down before the word of God. Because anyone can tell you a lot of good things. You're doing great. Keep doing it. But it is the power of the gospel that will work in us. And so I urge you, this Thanksgiving, as you gather together with whoever you can while social distancing and following public health guidelines, maybe 
on this Thanksgiving Sunday, we can join in with the Israelites on that day when they celebrated the harvest of finishing the wall. Gather together to read God's word, to share stories of God's faithfulness, because at the end of the day, that's what harvesting is. It's being reminded of God's faithfulness. Sometimes our harvest can be big. Sometimes our harvest can be small. Now, if that had to do with our own doings, that would be very difficult. But if it's a reminder of God's faithfulness, every harvest is a bountiful harvest. And as the Bible stories tell us, Sometimes we move away from thankfulness. Sometimes we move away from faithfulness when things go bad and we fail again and again and again. Just like the Israelites, if we look at the story through non-godly views, what we see is that, well, there was this really clever guy, Nehemiah, who came and who led his people to build the wall. Well, They built the wall. The Israelites built the wall. So they could have done it in their own power. Positive thinking. You can build this wall. But that's not what it is. God works in Nehemiah to give his people hope. And God does that over and over and over and over again. Because God persists forever. And God never gives up, even to the point of giving us his son, the eternal sign of God's wonderful love for us. Brothers and sisters, on this Thanksgiving Sunday, we have much to give thanks for. But as I share, the reality is that there's a lot of reasons why we should grieve. But remember, God never gives up. God never gives up. And God's faithfulness is what we will harvest. Let's pray. God, we have seen in in the book of Nehemiah how you are working through Nehemiah. You have sown your seed You've allowed it to grow. You've allowed it to be pruned. And you've allowed the people to harvest. But in all of this, we realize that it's not really up to us. Because if it was about us, there's so many reasons to grieve. There's so many reasons to weep. Because throughout history, throughout Even the Bible, we see the people, the people of the promise, the people of the covenant fail and fail and fail and fail again. But it is your faithfulness, the hope that we find in you that continues to allow us to get up, to focus our eyes on you, to be thankful for the harvest that you give us regardless of the signs. Because it's not about us, is it, God? It's about your story. It's about your vision. And God, we realize that you, the grower, the farmer, are so relentless that you will not give up. You will continue to grow in us. You will continue to prune in us. God, on this Thanksgiving Sunday, where we are experiencing Thanksgiving that is totally different from a Thanksgiving that we've ever experienced before with so many limitations. God, we come to you and we ask for your grace. We rely on your hope that you give to us. God, we thank you for your continued work in us and the world around us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our song of response
is a thanksgiving hymn that we know so well. Now thank we all our God with heart and heart hands and voices who wondrous things has done in whom his world rejoices. Let us stand as we sing. Now thank we all our God. Please be seated. Our offering, Thanksgiving offering, is first for congregational ministry, and second offering is for our missionary, Kathy Vanderkloot, who is in Nigeria. And we also have um, an offering of music, an offertory. Um, but before that, let us pray. God, we give you thanks for, for your amazing grace, for your continued working in us, allowing us to be your hands and feet. And I especially pray that the gifts that we bring to you can be used for your love so that there can be thanksgiving in our neighborhood, in our community, and all around the world. Allow us to be your hands and feet. I especially pray for Kathy, who's in Nigeria, who is working for Nigerian missions. We pray that the gifts that we bring can become many prayers of thanksgiving in the ministry that you are working through Kathy. And we're grateful for the ministry of music that you give us and the technology that can be used for this. And we lift all these up to you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Gloria and Stephanie, for um, that wonderful gift of music. Let us now come to God in prayer. Let us offer our prayers to God for the life of the world and for all God's people in their daily life and work. God, the beginning and end of all things in your providence and care, you watch increasingly over all creation. We offer our prayers that in us and in all your people, your will may be done according to your wise and loving purpose in Christ our Lord. Lord of all life, hear our prayer. We pray for all through whom we receive sustenance and life, for farmers and agricultural workers, for packers, distributors, and company boards. As you have so ordered our life that we depend upon each other, enable us by your grace to seek the well-being of others before our own. Lord of all creation, hear our prayer. We pray for all engaged in research to safeguard crops against disease and to produce abundant life among those who hunger and whose lives are at risk. Prosper the work of their hands and the searching of their minds that their labor may be for the welfare of all. Lord of all wisdom, hear our prayer. We pray for governments and aid agencies in those areas of the world where there is disaster, drought, and starvation. By the grace of your spirit, touch your hearts and the hearts of all who live in comfortable plenty and make us wise stewards of your gifts. Lord of all justice. We pray for those who are ill, remembering those who are in hospital, nursing homes, and all who are known to us. We especially lift up Kathy, Gerda, and Lynn as they continue in their treatment. We lift up Paul, Jane, Kayla, Seeb, and baby Annika, Everett, as they continue to recover. We also lift up those in our own circles that are battling sickness, those who are in need of our prayers. We pray for all who care for them, give skill and understanding to all who work for their well-being. Lord of all compassion, hear our prayer. We remember those who have died, whom we entrust to your eternal love and the hope of resurrection to new life. Lord of all peace, hear our prayer. We offer ourselves to your service, asking that by the spirit at work in us, others may receive a rich harvest of love and joy and peace. Lord of all faithfulness, God of grace, as you are ever at work in your creation, so fulfill your wise and loving purpose in us and in all for whom we pray, that with them and in all that you have made, your glory may be revealed and the whole earth give praise to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. It's been wonderful to spend Thanksgiving Sunday and worship with all of you. Um, it's, it's always wonderful to worship with you, but it's especially wonderful to give thanks to our God together as a community of faith, because that's what the Israelites did. They came together and they worshiped God. Just um, to let you know, this coming week, um, I will be at a, in a virtual conference um, in Grand Rapids. So it's held in Grand Rapids. I'll be attending virtually for pastors who have started their second call. So um, I'll be attending that. I'm so grateful for Pastor Jack Voss, who will be leading the worship service next Sunday. I hope to be blessed by it, and I hope to sit with you and worship with you as a community of faith. And so as we go for here, let us join together for the closing song that we've been singing for this series, My Friends, May We Grow in Grace. Let us stand as we sing.
brothers and sisters, Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Brothers and sisters, go and enjoy that wonderful feast that God gives us because God wants us to enjoy him. Enjoy all the gifts that God has given us. So go and enjoy it and then be a blessing to your family, to your community, and to your world. Amen.